Good morning and welcome to today's show. I say good morning because I am here in the UK, but it is evening time for you on the other side of the world, Dr. Robin. And today we are here to talk about how to exclusively breastfeed, tips to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Hello, Dr. Robin. How are you today? Hi, Chelsea. Lovely to see you again. Yes, we always chat before the show, so it's a bit funny to say hello. Like, we can reach out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Do get in touch whilst we are chatting today. We love to hear from you. Um, tell us where you're at. Tell us your situation. Are you pregnant? Are you breastfeeding? Um, we really like to hear your stories. So as I said, this is Dr. Robin Thompson. Um, Dr. Robin has based her entire PhD research on why so many women experience painful breastfeeding complications. If you want to hear more about Dr. Robin's research or the Thompson Method, do pop a comment below because I would love to share more. So, like I said, how to exclusively breastfeed. Dr. Robin, can you please, in your own marvellous words, tell us what you would say is exclusively breastfeeding? Well, it's the to begin with, it's understanding in pregnancy how milk production is made and how to avoid um, the common, most common complication, which is nipple trauma. Mm. And then, uh, of course, following that is, is um, breast engorgement and mastitis. So they are the important things that came along with my research. Uh, and, and so exclusive breastfeeding begins with a mother with her baby, not everybody else with her baby. Mm. Where and whenever possible, her baby should be with her. She, her and her baby are unique and they need to be together. And I always say we're the only mammals on the planet that let someone else take our babies unless they're the animals in the zoo. Very true. It does feel like yeah. a zoo sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah. So I, think, um, I think that's the beginning point. The other really important beginning point is not cutting the cord, waiting for the placenta and the uterus to finish the work they need to do with the baby. And that's really important too. So that adds another dimension to heading towards exclusive breastfeeding. Absolutely. And some of you may be wondering, well, that doesn't detail what is exclusively breastfeeding, but actually we would argue that it does because exclusively breastfeeding is, is so much more than just what the meaning of it is. It's how mm -hmm. you will accomplish it and, yes. and those first, that you know, pregnancy as well, we'll get into that in a moment. But like Dr. Robin said, that first breastfeed and that, that moment after giving birth will determine your, I suppose, your success towards being able to successfully breastfeed exclusively as well. So I'm glad we have spoke about that because what I was about to say is consider this, that what is being currently taught is actually not working. When you consider breastfeeding rates, well, breastfeeding rates, and, and Dr. Robin's research, um, you spoke a lot about um, the the decline, didn't you? The decline in initiation of breastfeeding to then having interruptions and also a lot of interventions in the first few hours um, following days and weeks with formula, bottles, and other other things that really and, do contribute. And no increase in breastfeeding rates. But one, one of the things that strikes me is if, if, if we could work with a mother during her pregnancy and she's feeling her baby she's in tune only she knows and what what i talk about is ask the question is your baby hiccuping because if the baby's hiccuping it's drinking it's already learning to drink in utero so the worst thing we can do is to separate and it's it's hiccuping to lay down fluid so that it's the first three days before the milk comes in it's it's able to draw on interstitial fluid from the cells that, it, that they, and it's also um, you know for many other reasons too without going into all the detail but it is a very important point in pregnancy to know that the baby is hiccuping um, and then you know say the baby was breech or head down we talk about different things how to, yes, how to create you said, that. you said that last week it's very interesting yeah. I went and watched the video how to create the best uh, 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 amniotic fluid uh, drink for the baby. <laughs> yeah, but how fascinating. And it's logical. Yeah. Everything that you have included in your research and many that I speak to, many women that I speak to who have followed the principles of the Thompson Method always say, it's just logic. It's just so simple and almost a bit, 
why didn't we think of this before but equally yeah. mind-blowing because it just yeah. it all clicks in pace and it, it does it makes sense so so we're asking you today to consider that what is being taught is not working and to look at world breastfeeding rates how many women initiate breastfeeding and want to breastfeed and then are forced to quit before maybe they've even started or um, in the early weeks before before they want to and and many mm -hmm. seem to think that actually world breastfeeding late rates are low because of returning to work because many many countries don't allow lengthy periods of maternity leave which i sure i'm sure does contribute but actually and your research does show that the number one reason is pain it's nipple trauma and pain right mm -hmm. yes that's right absolutely right sense. and and we've proven that time and time again with the way women um uh like when i do my fine tuning sessions or we're sitting on the on the couch with someone and just quietly watching maybe talking her through a little bit of how to fine tune to have best oral cavity function that we can achieve yeah that so I, remember, I remember the saving moment with you myself yeah <laughs> and so when we can do that we and when we can share the information of the craniocervical spine, the oral cavity and the function of the oral cavity, the tongue muscle, the frenula in the mouth and not, and avoid cutting them, then we can talk about more about how a mother can achieve her breastfeeding journey. It, you know, and there might be some little things that stop her along the way, but primarily her baby is her baby, no one else's baby. And, and actually, I think that when we work alongside these wonderful women, especially um, particularly in the club, not so much in the rescue group, but particularly in the breastfeeding club, which is our support network, um, I think we really can see a huge difference for women that are prepared or, or have access to the education during their pregnancy, which is what you just said. So let's talk about the next point here. So labour, birth and breastfeeding are not disconnected. And actually, I should add on there, pregnancy labor birth and breastfeeding yeah. are not and think about so, it from conception to the birth of the baby to the first hours to the first days to the first week are transitions for the mother and her baby they're not separate you know we talk about pregnancy being separate from the onset and the progress of labor that's not so it's a progress that's unique to that mother and her baby and often based on a lot based on the genetic background so if we think about it as a transition that's normal for that mother and that baby of course there'll be reasons why things don't go the way they should or way the way the way they were expected but you know that's you can't ever expect 100 percent guarantee and nobody can but if the least intervention we do the more likely that mother is to enjoy the special moments with her baby without other people interfering. There's nothing urgent at birth unless the baby's APGAR score is less than seven. And then the baby may need some help and, and those professionals know how to uh, help the baby. They know what and to it do. Is, it's it's very interesting how mm. now that I know it is very, like I said, it's very logical. But before and, and, and with giving birth and preparing and writing up my birth plan with Jacob um, just over two years ago, you know, I was constantly told to be flexible. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the birth plan in a moment. But I didn't actually understand how the decisions I made during labour and the birth would so um, sometimes so negatively impact my first breastfeed, which then, of course, has a bit of a domino effect afterwards. Um, it's what you call the cascade of interventions, right? Mm. And, and I think having access to education during pregnancy really helps me this time around and many, many thousands of women who have been mm. successful from the start mm. because they're able to make decisions, informed decisions mm -hmm. from the very beginning. And even if they are having to make a decision where they will need opiates or other interventions because of um, X reason, personal reason, whatever else, it's their choice, um, they know how to uh, be prepared for that. So I think what you're saying really <laughs> resonates with me and everyone, yeah. because it's true. And there are other ways of not having opiates too, depending on the circumstances. They can have uh, sterile water, uh, uh, bleb injections, which then block the pain pathway. But again, they're not encouraged because that doesn't mean there's control of the mother then. And they're cheap. Yes, and cheaper. also... <laughs> 
the opiates actually affect the baby. And we uh, who are working with women from birth all the way through to, uh, you know, whenever the women need to be assisted or encouraged, then uh, we see the baby's behaviour. We know what's going on. The mother knows even before us. She gives us a lot of the clues. And if I hadn't have been involved in 25 years of birthing at home with wonderful women, I don't think my my experiences would have been, or my knowledge would never have been as wise as it is now. So I think I've reached the experienced knowledge and now I'm at the wisdom stage. <laughs> the wisdom stage, you certainly are, and you're sharing that, yeah. sharing that with us all. Yeah, yeah I, think, um, I think the fact that you have, you know, the, the unique perspective of both working alongside women and um, birthing at hospital and at home is really what kick-started um, the entire Thompson Method, I suppose, your research, your knowledge, your wisdom, as you say, because you can see such a difference. And that is linked to the interventions, I would say. Mm. And when you're privileged like me to see women who are having these horrific complications coming out of hospital, it, you have to ask questions. You can't just sit there and say, oh, well, this is what happens. You have to know why this is happening. So that was how it all started, wanting to know why. And uh, it took a little bit of time to gather up everything I needed to, to be able to understand it. It took lots of discussion with other people who were interested in what I was doing and lots of encouragement, lots of encouragement from experts in, in, uh, in say, the craniocervical spine, the nuchal ligament, uh, experts like my professors who taught me how to write, <laughs> Unlikely. Uh, how to present my, how to present my uh, thesis, you know. I, yeah, I research is very, very difficult and yeah. your research thesis is very detailed and I should imagine. I was, was never planning to do anything like that. I was encouraged. So my role in my, in my profession is to encourage, not to tell people what to do, how to do it to make suggestions that might work for them because I have the, the absolute um, privilege of working with a mother one-on-one -on -one almost all of the time. So that gives me so much information with her, with her voice, with her facial expression, with her body, watching shape, size and watching how she works. That gives me an amazing amount of information. And I'm mm. sure if any of our rescue group members or even club members are watching, they can really relate to what Dr. Robin just said, because we really do feel that you almost feel privileged to be in our time as we equally do with you. And um, I know just after one session with yourself, I was in a complete different place. It turned everything around for me and, and it saved my breastfeeding journey. Um, I just really regret, it's my only regret, not taking the jump and um, investing i suppose investing in my breastfeeding journey from the start because i honestly truly believe i would have had a pretty perfect um, breastfeeding journey from the start if i hadn't have had those forceful interventions um, in those hours following birth so i don't i do love talking about the um the connection and the transition as you call it between mm -hmm. labor and birth because it's mm -hmm. very beautiful and very true so I want to go into the three golden hours. Now, if you're interested in learning more about three golden hours, we have lots of very informative videos. We have a, a wonderful blog um, and we have lots of other resources floating about. And if you want to really get into detail and be fully prepared for that first breastfeed, um, I would love to share more about Dr. Robin's online education. There's an entire module based on the hold your hands, walk through the three golden hours. And it's about understanding how your body works to produce that precious liquid gold and, and that helps you then to have confidence in your body and your baby and it also gives you the the ability to make informed decisions like dr robin says each time we speak how important that is because it's your it's your choice it's your baby your body and your choice so the three golden hours then robin are the first breastfeed right uninterrupted yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's the transition of colostrum to the baby's stomach to prepare the baby's um, uh, gastrointestinal system for for the future and and immediate and the future, and it's the rich precious gold that tra the baby transfers. Uh, so it's another transition. So when the baby's born, it transitions to learn to drink. When it learns to drink later, it transitions to learn to eat, and then when it's eating and it's teething, it transitions to learn to <laughs> chew. <laughs> 
<laughs> such a fun so time, lots of maths. Lots yeah, of so fighting. continuous transitions does this little baby and the mother go through. And, you know, right through to, you know, even the transitions are hard when they leave home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It never stops. No, you think it, it never when stops. When they're newborn, you think it's going to get easier. Then yeah. they're toddlers, you wish for the newborn. So, so the three golden hours is very important to breastfeeding and very important to other people not handling the baby during that time. Certainly not for re routine procedures. If a baby's APCAR is less than seven, that may well be expected. But it depends on the circumstances, the mother's history, a whole lot of factors. And in the moment, it depends on how the baby is as well. So again, you don't make absolute statements. You just talk about the suggestions and how things might be, might be. But I believe the baby needs that time. And I've proven that over time because the first part generally is just them smelling, tasting, touching, moving, feeling wonderful with mum. And mum, the, the same feeling that's welling in the mother and, and the partner beside her too. You know, there's all these beautiful moments in time that you you need to have that time together to be able to experience how it makes you feel. It makes you feel wonderful. So the three golden hours is based on time for the mother and the baby, time for the baby to use its sensory skills and activate breastfeeding, and, it's, and, and all its reflexes for survival. So when you watch the newborn baby, it is really based on survival. The baby is ready to go to survive. So then uh, the baby feeds when it does, and that might take the baby half an hour to an hour to make its way to the breast if it's not too sleepy with opiates. Um, it, will, it will take in many cases that time, sometimes it'll be quick, quicker, sometimes it'll be a bit longer. And then feeding from both breasts leisurely and swapping it's sides and swapping sides. So we bring that colostrum down and then there's a sleep period, a transition to a rest period generally. Another transition, yeah. another gentle, beautiful yeah. transition. I actually spoke to a wonderful mother last week, Robin, you'll be very thrilled to hear. Yeah, another wonderful three golden hour story from one of our club members. And and she said that this was her this was her fourth baby and she was unsuccessful. This is her words, unsuccessful in breastfeeding previously. And this time she'd really enjoyed it because she just took control of everything. And and she said, and e even the thought of not being able to achieve those three golden hours didn't scare me because I knew there was a plan in place. I had all this information, these resources, and I knew what to do. And mm. um, And she said to me, that understanding what the ABCAR score is and that if mm. baby is seven or above, that the baby is allowed to be with me, understanding that alone was a game changer for her. So if anyone's watching, I can see a few comments coming. If anyone's watching and wondering about achieving the three golden hours and if you can't or how, how you know you're allowed to, allowed to is something that I hear a lot as well, which is quite scary. You are it? allowed to. There must be consent unless it's an absolute emergency. Mm -hmm. And then the senior obstetrician will make the decisions, not the young doctors, the senior obstetrician. Yes. But, you know, and it, understanding the APGAR score is actually yeah. key to that because there's no reason why they should be taking away babies with an APGAR score seven, eight, nines. So what we'll do is if you do want to learn more about the APGAR score, Dr. Robin has shared and created a really wonderful, informative document, a PDF that we will share with you. So just comment APGAR score below if you'd like to learn more about that and um, anything else that you've you've heard us talk about today. And, yeah. and actually, Sierra, um, I'll connect with you personally after we finish filming, um, talking about C-section and three golden hours, Robin. She's asking about that. So I'll share some information with her as well. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. And thank you to Teresa as well. Here you go, Robin. We love these, don't we? We love, we love these, we love these. Absolutely right. I saw that for 20 years as a paediatric nurse and UNICEF breastfeeding consultant. I experienced that twice. And after 18 years, I had breast issues. I love your work, she said. It's just oh, thank so you, very common, isn't it? Teresa, thank you, thank you. Very good well, indeed. So, Let's talk about the birth and breastfeeding plan because I think it fits in quite nicely to everything we've touched upon today. And I want to share with you, we've done other sessions on more detailed um, discussion on this. But today I just want to share a comment that I have seen so many times in recent weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but this particular comment, I just felt compelled to share it and discuss it with you. 
But my doctor said there is no point in having a birth plan because things don't go to plan anyway. There you go. I'll leave it wow. there. I'll let you. <laughs> but that means a mother can't. <laughs> what would you say plan to that? What she wants to do now? Was that a male or a female doctor? Because that's not reasonable. And we are supposed to be reasonable and accountable for our actions as well. So if a mother chooses to talk about how she sees her birth taking place, her pregnancy, her labour, her birth, the transitions taking place, she has a right to do that. And the responsibility of us, the professionals, to sit and talk, sit, see, I say sit, not stand over, but sit in a comfortable place and talk with her about what she sees her journey will be and then doing everything possible to help her make that journey real for her. And that's a responsibility. We should do that. Of course, when things deviate, then we rethink and we do that together. But we have an understanding of that during our conversation. We know that, that if, if, if things do deviate, there'll be, you know, someone to help depending on the circumstances. And, and none of us can really predict. No one can predict. No one can give a 100% guarantee. But the important thing is we do not go out to cause harm. That's very important. However, I do think we need to sit down beside and talk with women more and not say that it won't work because mainly it doesn't work because of the cascading intervention. Yes. And, and this is what I found interesting about this comment. As soon as I saw it, the, I, the first question that popped into my head was, well, I suppose the first thing I, I noticed was how definitive that was. Things never go to plan, it almost seems like he or she. No, and the doctor has telling to plan her. for the woman, not the woman that planned for her birth. Yeah, and it seemed almost you you you're not going to have control. That's what this this poor yes, lovely mama was right. being told. Yeah. And I just felt like it was almost unfair that before mm. she's even experienced, she was a first time mum, so she really does not. And I remember it so well. She does not know what to expect in mm. terms of the actual experience, physically, emotionally, but within the environment as well. She yes. just does not yeah. know what to expect. And um, I spoke with her and um, we, we discussed the cascade, cascade of interventions and going back to the APCAR score again, which is very helpful. And she's actually joined into the club and she's already exploring the resources and she's already actually quite shocked at how many women are just kindly and gently saying, no, thank you, you know? Mm, yes. and, and actually I've learned since and um, from watching your video surrounding um, your birth plan um, template and, and the resources you've provided for us to create our own unique plan. I've actually learned that we're in a position, even if things don't go to plan, to still be in control because we can, like you say, sit yeah. down, discuss our preferences, discuss what happens in a case of emergency and mm -hmm. otherwise let them know as soon as possible, I'd like baby to be here or or wherever mum mum and, and doctor or or midwife has have discussed it. And it is it changes the game, I think, for women to know that they they are in control. It's their body and their baby. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and the the baby needs to smell and touch the mother. The mother needs to smell and touch her baby. She has carried this baby. It is her baby. And as much as possible we should, as much as possible, I can't we should make that absolutely our first goal. Yeah, Obviously. and we've just had a lovely comment from um, Lauren. I, I recognise your name, Lauren. Hi, it's, it's lovely to hear from you. She said, there's actually a section in the programme where Dr. Robin talks about what to do in the event of mother-baby separation. There is, there's lots of resources on this. There's a lovely um, piece written by Dr. Robin, her own words, um, and, and it's Dr. Robin explains dot 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 what to do in the case of mother baby separation and there are lots of resources and lots of beautiful reassuring success stories as well so please don't feel disheartened but we consider that preparation is absolutely key for breastfeeding success so and thank you for reaching out lauren thank you so much yeah and understanding the first breastfeed is very very important and making sure that nobody else handles the baby during that time because yeah, if the baby sure. is forcefully pushed to the breast, then that's when the complications begin. So all of those factors are so important to that mother and her baby. Yeah, and I think that additionally, the first breastfeed and what, what actually contributes, contributes to achieving that is understanding, knowing and exercising your rights. Yeah. That's why it's so important, right? So mm. that you can be in control and make those informed decisions. 
Mm. So I think the most important thing myself and many women have taken away, you might agree, Lauren, is having access to this education, your wonderful self, your wisdom, Dr. Robin, and the <laughs> just incredible empowering team of women that are behind the Thompson Method community. I think it allows us to finally trust our instincts. Why is it so important to be able to really lock into that? Um, instinctive knowledge is the best guide. Honestly, it is the best guide. Only the mother knows. She senses internally, she's aware. And then if we listen to her instincts, then she gives us much of the answers. And I can tell you that through my Q&A sessions. If I read the last paragraph first, there's the answer. But I go through reading what they've said in the order that they choose to, to yes. respect what they've put. But if <laughs> almost 98% of the time, there's the answer. She already knows. Yes. So it's if you true. encourage her instinctive knowledge, then that makes life much easier for her too. Yeah. And I think that a lot of external factors and, and fear mongering, unfortunately, um, doesn't help. But like I said, um, with the education, the knowledge and the support of the wonderful team, we're able to take a moment to really just kick in and think, what what was what is my gut telling me, I suppose? Mm. Looking at baby and, and working together. Yeah. So just to elaborate on our session, um, Dr. Robin, thank you so much because this session has been very helpful and I wish I'd seen something like this when I was pregnant with Jacob. Um, but for anyone watching, if you have any questions, do get in touch and I will connect with you. We have another live session coming next week, which is very closely related to today's session and do catch our other sessions as well. We had a wonderful story last week with a beautiful mum who shared her her, finally, she said she's enjoying breastfeeding after three attempts. So that's very lovely. But so exclusively breastfeeding, for those that are asking, um, usually means or is understood as um, breast human breast milk alone without um, adding supplementing uh, with non-human milk. Would you like to add anything to that, Robin? Yes, because when you look at the uh, mammal species that provide breast milk for their babies, their milk is specific. It's species-specific. So can you imagine the human baby drinking um, elephant milk or camel milk? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, so... it's just not proportionate for the tiny human baby. And then if you can imagine the mouse trying to drink the elephant milk or even the human milk. So when, when I say species specific, that's quite documented in the research. And, uh, and so that our little babies, our human babies, are, are meant to have the maternal milk. That's what's designed for them. The maternal body, uh, the baby initiates, helps initiate the, the uh, increase in volume in the first three days. And then the baby helps regulate that volume, which is quite high. It's for, very magic, isn't it? For it's, survival. It's, it's up high for survival after about yeah. the third, fourth day. <laughs> and I think the thing that I always loved most about your work before I even joined what is my, it's, it's an absolute dream to be a part of this, but the thing that I always was very drawn to is that you are, you are a, a big expresser, let's say, of how it's a woman's choice. If you choose to breastfeed, if that's what you want to do, then there should be no one there um, taking that away from you. And there should be no, no circumstances in which are forced upon you, um, formula being forced in the early days, because of there's so many reasons that are, some women are being told. Yeah. But of course, baby, if you don't choose to breastfeed, that's different. That's not what we're discussing today. No, no. And we do support a mother who does need to feed her baby other milk. We always support them. And we talk about how they can calm the digestive system, lots of other things as well, but simulate how the baby would work at the breast if it was working at the breast. We do do that. Nobody's excluded. However, we're talking today about exclusive breastfeeding exactly. and, and, you know, our bodies are designed to achieve that. Our baby's faces are designed to achieve that. Our yes. bodies are just perfect and so are our babies. What happens is there's so many negatives about, oh, no, you've got um, flat nipples, you've got 
you know, you've got, to, your breasts are too big or your breasts are too... Well, I couldn't breastfeed, so yeah. you won't be able to. Or your breasts They're are too so small, big. you'll never be able to breastfeed. Well, it, it's not the way to give the mother the best possible chance to achieve what she needs to achieve. So I try to keep the negatives out of it and create the positives and to encourage her to do what she needs to do, not what I want her to do, but what she needs to do and look at her as an individual, very unique, genetically unique. She's different to every other mother on the planet, genetically, biophysiologically, psychologically, neurologically, anatomically different. You know, it's not something that we can make set statements about it's all about that mother and her baby and if it's her third or a fourth baby it's about that baby you yes. know it's it's i'm sure the wonderful kelly could uh, her story definitely backs that up i think yeah breastfed five babies baby number six she really struggled with That's I'll right. her story at yeah. as well so yes if you're watching we hope that we have helped you um take a take a step on the path towards feeling like you are more confident and do reach out so that we can connect you with what i can connect you with you personally and share some more information on dr robin's online education so that you can be fully fully prepared for for any scenario and your unique journey that you're about to embark on how very exciting and we hope that watching this has helped you realize that breastfeeding is possible for you, it's absolutely possible. So um, congratulations on your pregnancy if you are pregnant or your new baby or anywhere along your journey where you are. Thank you so much for watching. Robin. And of course, can I just add to that? It's Please possible do. for most women. There are women in my experience that have congenital abnormalities. There are women who've had um, serious things happen absolutely. to it. But, you know, again, we still help those women. We don't, yeah. you know, tell them that, it, it depends on those unique circumstances. So yes, my we're very is very diverse. Unique women, very yeah. important. Yeah. Okay. Thank so you are inclusive here. We're we're doing we're doing as much as we can to make sure that everyone feels like they have a yes. chance at achieving their own unique goal because everyone's yeah. goals are so different. Absolutely. But thank you so much for once again sharing your wisdom, knowledge, and time because we know you're so busy. Um, and yes, we just want to make sure that everyone realizes that as Dr. Robin showed me, it's our baby, our body and it's our journey. So thank you all. And we will see you back here um, next week at the same time to um, continue this session. So thank you so much, everyone. And take care. Thank Bye -bye. you, lovely Chelsea. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Robin. <laughs> take care.